And our world doesn't stop right here, does it? It goes all over the place, and you're seeing that in some of the projects that we're able to participate in, in Ghana and in Togo and in the Philippines. And I'm excited. You know, our deacons and I are in budgeting phase right now. We're ending out the year, and September will roll over into our new year. And I'm excited about what God's got planned for our church. It's his church, isn't it? He's just put us here to work it right now. So I'm excited and I can't wait until we're done with budgeting and we can come to the church and you can have input into that and where we're going in the next year. For me, every year, that has been an exciting time to show you how good God has been. And, you know, it would be one thing for us to say, you know, just give so we can build big buildings and make everything fancy around here. But no, you've spent recently, in the last two years, you spent, I have to do public math, so, and it's written up here, so I have to look up there to get it. Uh, you do the same thing. Don't laugh at me. I, I got to do public math. So you spent 17000 something dollars on some projects in the Philippines. On top of that, you sent $4,500 with the team to the Philippines. On top of that, you have spent $7,000 in Togo. You've spent twelve thousand or 10000 in Ghana. And then you've spent another right at 14000 in Ghana building those projects there. And I forgot a $300 roof in the Philippines. You know what a a worldly person could do? They could say, you know what, you add all that up. You know what we could do around here with that kind of money? Nothing. Because it wouldn't have been there, right? That's what the world thinks of. In fact, when we talk about tithing, that's what the world thinks of. You know, I think every, every year when Bob sends out that statement, for me at least, it's an exciting time. And I'm not talking about tithing today, and I don't even know how I got here, Phil. But anyway, it's there. I love getting that statement because it's like, wow, we did more than last year. I can't wait to see our goal should be this for next year. It's an exciting time. And when you understand tithing, you'll see why it's an exciting time. Because you can't outgive God, can you? And this church, you have been so faithful in the area of missions. We've taken on not just partnering in the Philippines, not just doing some building projects there in in Africa, but we're, we're even partnering with two brand new church plants down south of us. And we are the main piece of a church plant right here in Fort Worth now, Mission Stella. And I'm praying that that thing takes off. And I was talking this week in a meeting with Brother Omar. And he said, I've got a family. And I don't know if you were, if you were standing next to me when that happened, Phil. But he says he has a couple that wants to move to Mission Stella into that apartment complex. And they desire to plant a church in that area. That's part of what we're doing as a church. We're not trying to build our kingdom. We're trying to build his kingdom. And when you see videos like this, that ought to remind you that we're building his kingdom, not ours. Why? Because salvation is only of the Lord. We cannot do it, but he can. Last week, we talked about the fact that salvation was of the Lord and him alone so that we should be able to rejoice in him. Today, In the passage we're in, you want to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to pick up in verse 8 today. Today, the question in this passage is, do you know him and the power of his resurrection? Not just know about him. Know about him is not enough. We've talked about that before. Just knowledge is not enough. It's the application of that knowledge. It's making it personal, making it a relationship with him. But when he adds in this passage to know the power of his resurrection, that changes everything. 
You can go to every religion, and I use that word lightly because they're, they're human, they're man-made. You go to every religion and you find their original leaders, and guess where their original leaders are today? In the grave. The power of the resurrection is what makes all the difference here. So that's the question for today. Do you know him? And do you know the power of his resurrection? If you're able and willing, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? We're going to be today in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8 down through verse 11. And God's word says this, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake... I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Verse 9, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his, his sufferings Becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this passage. And I thank you for your resurrection, the power of your resurrection from the dead. And as we study that today, help us to understand that knowing you is more important than anything else. That the power of your resurrection makes all the difference in our life even today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now, if you remember your handout, when we started the book of Philippians, there was a place in there called the key concept. I'm going to read that to you. If you've got it stuffed away in your Bible, you can pull it out. Look for that one called key concept. And it says this. It says, the most important and joyful thing in life is to know Christ. Isn't that what he's talking about right here in chapter 3? In fact, the entire chapter of chapter 3 is talking about knowing Christ. So this is where this concept comes from. It comes from chapter 3. That's what Paul is talking about. Paul understands it. He gets it. He understands the power of Christ's resurrection. He understands that salvation is only of the Lord. And he knows that knowing Christ is the most important thing in all of the life, in all of life. It's not, the most important thing is not being the boss. It's not getting the promotion. It's not making six figures or what have you. It's knowing Christ. What good is all the money in the world one split second after you leave this world? It's all useless then to you, right? It doesn't change anything in eternity. But knowing Christ does. Christ knowing you does. Listen, Paul has just listed off his resume. You remember last week when we were talking about his resume? All these things that he had accomplished in life. He could have taken all of that and said, Look, I am more qualified. I should be the guy. Right? Because of all these things that I have accomplished. So he's just listed off all of that stuff. And he told us last week in verse 7, he laid it all aside. He didn't count it as worthy. And then he gets to verse 8. This is what Paul says about his resume. He says, I, I, I did it. I had it all, you know, spell checked and grammar checked and proofread. And it's beautiful. It looks good on paper. And this is what he says about his resume. Look back at verse 8. Indeed, I count everything on my resume, everything he had just mentioned in the previous passage. He said, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered. In other words, he forfeited all of that stuff on his resume. He set him aside or he forfeited all of those humanly or, or accomplishments because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. He says, knowing Christ is more important than anything that we can accomplish in this world. He says, the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish. He says, they're rubbish, they're trash, in order that I might gain Christ. That's his response 
to everything that he had accomplished in life, everything that he was known for. Remember, he mentioned his zeal, which seemed a little contradictory, right? Because he was known for his zeal, as in his, his zeal to persecute believers, right? But they, he knew, hey, if you, can have, if you can have that kind of zeal, we need a guy like you. Right? If you ever had somebody call you and say, look, we, we're selling these products online and we want you to be a representative. We want, well, I'm too busy. Well, that's the kind of people we're looking for, right? They're like, if you're too busy, then you can obviously cram this in there too. That's, they, they never take no for an answer, right? Paul is saying, did you see my resume, Lord? It says persecutor of believers, I killed Christians for a living, and now you want me to be a missionary? God says, I can use a person like you. Your zeal. He was known for that. He set all of that aside. Now, last week, we talked about the words um, loss and profit, and they were accounting terms. Now, today, he goes further. He calls it something else. He doesn't necessarily call it profit and loss. He, he calls it trash. He calls it rubbish. When you look up this word in the Greek, it can even be translated as dung or manure, right? That's what he thought of it. He's like, all of my accomplishments, if I stepped in them, I wouldn't be allowed in the house. That's how, that's how nasty they are. If I stepped in them, I would have to go to the faucet and, and wash off my shoes before mama lets me in the house. He says, that's what I count them as, as trash, as rubbish, as useless. None of that can save me. He knew that salvation was only of the Lord, not his resume. He set all of that aside. Now, why did he feel that way? Verse 8, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. You can have the best car, the biggest house, the, the biggest paycheck, the greatest job, the great, best workers, and none of that is, is, will, will amount up to knowing Christ Jesus. Surpassing worth. To him, it says he was, it was immeasurable. You can't measure the, the difference between knowing Christ and having this great resume. He says it's immeasurable. It, it doesn't, it's not even in the same classification. To know Christ is worth more, he says, than anything. And he wants it to be personal or experiential. He says, I don't want to just have knowledge of him. I need it to be personal inside of me. It needs to be something that I experience. That's when it becomes priceless. That's when it becomes immeasurable. And that's when it makes a difference in our life is when it's personal. You know, if I say, well, my dad's a preacher, you know, so I must be in the club. True or false? False. It has to be personal, right? It has to be what I have done with what Jesus Christ did on the cross for me. My dad is responsible for how he responds to the gospel. I am responsible for how I respond to the gospel. And you are responsible for the way that you respond to the gospel. That's why when someone takes scripture and says, can I share with you what Jesus did for me? And look over here in Romans. And I want to tell you that Romans 3.23 says that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I want to go over here to Romans 5.8. And I want to tell you some more. And then in the end... And you say, now, wouldn't you like to follow Jesus Christ and ask him to come into your life and save you and be Lord and Savior of your life? And they say no, or they say not yet. We heard a testimony about that last night, did we not? The not yet, and that breaks our heart as believers. As What do you mean not yet? I just poured out all the truth to you, and you don't want to do it yet? It's not us doing the saving, is it? We can't convince you to follow Christ. We can't convince you or manipulate you or trick you into becoming a believer. God himself draws you close to him. He opens your eyes. He takes the scales off. He shows you the truth. And then you have to decide that I believe it. God does the saving. Not me. Not you. 
And for believers, sometimes that's the most difficult day of our life is hearing the not yet. Hearing that I'm not ready. I don't want to give up everything in my life just yet. I hear of people all the time that come and, and they say, well, I want to be a follower of Christ, but I don't want to change how I live. I don't want to change my lifestyle, right? I don't want to give up my friends. I don't want to give up all of that stuff. They don't think about what they gain. They, they, they come with the idea that, okay, heaven sounds better than hell, so let's get on that train, right? Let's at least make sure that we're in the club. I don't want to change my lifestyle. I don't want anything to be different. I don't want to, I don't want to be considered a Bible thumper or a Jesus freak or whatever the nicknames are today. I, I, I want to continue living like I am, like the world, looking like the world, acting like the world, but I want heaven. And God says it doesn't work that way. He says, when you become a believer, there will be evidence in your life. The Sermon on the Mount says, you're a tree, right? He says, if you're a tree, you should be producing fruit. Fruit that comes of the type of tree that you are. If everything hanging off of you is of the world, guess what you are? Of the world. You're not in Christ, you're of the world. That's the type of tree that you are. Apple trees don't produce pears, ever. They produce apples. Believers ought to be producing love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, self-control. They ought to be producing of their own kind. And if you're a believer in Christ, then we as believers in Christ, if we're likened to a tree, we ought to be producing believers in Christ, right? We can't go through life and say, well, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. So if I'm just a loving person, then there's evidence. True, but you're a believer. You ought to be producing believers in Christ. The rest of this chapter talks about Paul's gains. When someone comes and doesn't want to change their life, they think about, I want, to, I want heaven, but I don't want to give up. I don't want to lose. I don't want to have anything in the loss category that Paul talks about here. He says, they don't think about what they gain because there's more than just that because of the power of his resurrection. Here's the first thing that Paul gained. He gained a new knowledge. That's what verse 8 is talking about. If you look at verse 8, he's talking about, I've gained a new knowledge here that knowing Christ is worth more. It's the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Look at this over in Jeremiah chapter 9. It'll be on the screens for you. He says, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. He says, don't boast in yourself and how wise you are. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, here it comes, in this, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. He says, you want to boast? Boast that I know Christ. Well, how high up in the chain are you at work? Hey, that's nothing to boast about. Let me tell you what I have to boast about in Christ. You want to know what knowing and understanding there, there he's talking about? Look at the rest of the verse. That I, that God, am the Lord who practices steadfast love and justice and righteousness in the earth for these things I delight declares the Lord he says because I understand that he practices love and justice and righteousness because of all that I set aside all of my earthly accomplishments all those things that everybody in the world says wow great job to he says I count them all as rubbish because knowing Christ is better I can lose all of that because this is a true prophet. Jim Elliott, it'll be on the screen for you. He once wrote this. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You give up worldly accomplishments, you can't keep them, can you? To gain Christ, to gain a Lord and Savior, to gain eternity with God himself, we can't lose, can we? Here's the second thing that Paul gained. 
He gained a new righteousness. Look at verse 9. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. He says, it's not of me and my resume, which comes from the law. That's the only way I could compare myself to the rest of the world is whether or not I'm a good person, whether or not I'm following the law. He says, but this is the righteousness that I want. He says, but that which comes through, through faith in Christ, the righteousness, not that comes from my own doings, but from God's. He says, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. He got a new righteousness. His old righteousness was dependent on him following the law. Now, what did that look like in that time? Following the law included religious ceremonies, right? If I just do the ceremonies, if I just uh, um, practice the different feasts, if I do them in the way that the law says, then it would be righteous. That's self-righteousness. That's works, right? It's, it's a morality thing. Well, if I'm just a good person, well, then, then that's not God's righteousness. That's self-righteousness. It's confidence in my resume, in my own abilities. That's self-righteousness. That's not God's righteousness. That's of works of the flesh. And none of those religious rites, if we come in here today and we do the Lord's Supper, and we remember the broken body and the blood that was poured out for each and every one of us, some of us might come to it and say, well, this is a religious ceremony now. No, it's remembrance. It's not a ceremony. It's remembering that we were so dirty, rotten, nasty people that God saw that we had no way and that we were lost and without hope. And he says, I'm going to send my son and I'm going to let him be broken and poured out for you. When we were not worthy and he says, but I love you. That's a time that we love on him, that we remember how much he loved us and died on a cross for us to pay the penalty for our sins in this world. That should be a time that's personal, that's experiential between us and our Savior, not between us and a church, not between us and everybody else that's watching me. Well, I don't want to drink of the cup until everybody else does. I don't want to eat this until everybody else does. That's, that's quickly how it becomes a ceremony. And that's what he's talking about here. He says those religious ceremonies cannot save you. Only Christ can save. Only through him. This righteousness was from God made possible by the power of his resurrection. That's what he's talking about in this passage. And it has to do with his grace and his mercy that he poured out on us. And that's why Paul could lay aside all his human accomplishments for something that was much, much greater. Here's the third thing. He gained a new power. Look at verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Now, most of us want the verse to stop right there. Because the rest of the verse does not turn our way, does it? We want to talk about the power of his resurrection, which is the result of verse 8 of a deeper understanding of Christ. So we want to stop the verse right now. We don't want to talk about suffering. We don't want to talk about death. We don't want to talk about what the rest of that verse says. But it's all there. The power of his resurrection and the suffering with Christ go together. They're all together. We can't remove that from Scripture. We can't enjoy the power of His resurrection without the sufferings. Look at this, Romans chapter 6. It'll be on the screen for you. In verse 3, it says this, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? You know, in, in our pastor's discovery class this morning, we talked about baptism, and, and it shows us a picture. You know, when the person is standing up in the, in the baptistry, it's like a picture of the cross. And then when Christ was buried, I say something to the effect of buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. It's a picture of what's going on here. And it says we've been baptized into his death. But Jesus didn't stay there, did he? Three days later, he rose again. 
So the next time I baptize, I'm going to dunk you. And whoever's next, anybody want to be next? I'm going to hold you down there for three days. Okay, and let's just see. Charles knew where I was going already, right? I, I, I don't think that's going to work out. Not for you at least, right? But it's a picture of what Christ did for us. The same thing with the Lord's Supper. We remember what he's done for us. Look at verse 4 there in Romans chapter 6. We were, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. That's the reason I say what I say when I baptize someone, because of verses just like this. With him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, here's the good part. We have to go through the sufferings so that we can get to the resurrection so that we too might walk in newness of life. I hear some preachers, I think my dad even says it, I can't remember, when he raised, raised to walk in newness of life. That comes from that very verse right there in Romans 6, 4. Some of you one day will comfort someone else because of something you went through yourself, a tragedy something a, a part of your life that was horrible and one day God will use that he doesn't waste pain some one day God will use that and you will be able to encourage someone else that's going through the very same thing God doesn't waste that and the same thing happened with Christ right he comforts us today because he's already been through it Scripture teaches us time and time again that he's already been there and that's why he can, he can have credibility even in an unsaved person's mind that, wow, okay, if he went through that, well then maybe he does know what I'm talking about. And he can be drawn to a saving faith through realization like that. Christ can comfort us because he's already been through it and much, much more. Our worst day was nothing compared to the cross. Agreed? I know my worst day, and it's nothing compared to that. Here's the fourth thing, and I'm only going to introduce it today. We will pick it up in a couple of weeks, and we'll look at it more in detail. But the fourth thing he gained was a new goal. His goal before Christ came and said, I need a guy like you, was to build that resume, right? To stand out amongst his peers. He says, now I've got a new goal. Look at verse 11. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. He says, I don't need to build my resume anymore. I don't need to compare myself to other people or make everything in life about being self-righteous. He says, now it's about the resurrection. I want to get to the point where I can attain the resurrection of the dead. The only way you can attain the resurrection of the dead is to die or be caught up in the rapture, right? So he's saying even death is going to bring the good. Even death in this life, he says, by any means possible, he says, I don't know how I'm going to die. I don't know. By now, Paul might have an idea because he's made some enemies, right? But he says, I don't know how I'm going to die, but listen, that is the completion of my salvation. That resurrection of the dead. He says, I know how it ends, so I'm not worried about everything that life can throw at me. I, I'm, I'm more focused on the goal, the completion, when I get my glorified body. Paul's not quitting. He's working towards that. He says, I see that happening. One day I will die. One day, you know, Scripture says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment, right? So he knows that. He understands it. He knows that one day that will come for him and that God will resurrect him from the dead in a twinkling of an eye, and he'll be in the presence of his Savior, right? He understands all of that, but he's not quitting. He's not stopping telling people about Christ. He says, I'm going to work towards that. And I'm going to finish strong. It's kind of like a runner in the Olympics. You know, if you're running a 1,500 meter, you're probably not going to run as fast in the beginning as you will at the end. Right? You save a little energy for the sprint at the end. And then you leave it all on the track. Right? That's what they do. He says, I'm going to be running hard when I cross that line. That's what he's saying. He says, I'm not quitting here. I'm working towards it. So what is the power of his resurrection? 
if we had to define it, the best demonstration of his, the power of his resurrection was found at the cross. He raised himself from the grave. <laughs> That's power. You're not going to find that in another religion. You're not going to find that if you go to California someplace and, and, and shake a bush and some guy comes out and he's got his own religion. Right? They, they start cults all the time, all over the world. And you're not going to find someone who starts something big and then dies and then the next three days he's up and walking around again. Wait, what? That's different. That's the power of the God we serve. He's a big G God, not a little G God. He's the one and only God. Only he has the power to raise himself. That's the power of his resurrection. And that makes all the difference today. That's why we can rejoice in the Lord. You have to understand that Lord is not a name. We treat it like it's a name. It's not a name. It's a title. When somebody says, I want to give my life to, to Jesus Christ. I want him to be my Lord and Savior. They say they think that's an appositive. They think that's just saying his names. Two different names that mean the same thing. They don't. Lord is a title. He's in a position of power over you. Savior, Messiah, you might call those names. Jesus, Christ, you might call those names. But Lord, that's a title. It's always used as a title unless it's referring to a human. And then it's just whoever, it, it might be the man of the house, say. The Lord of the house. Position of authority, right? That's what it is when it's in reference to, to Christ himself. It's saying that's a title. It's a position of authority over us. And if he is in a position of authority over us, listen, believers, if he's in a position of authority over us and he has the power of the resurrection, he can raise himself from the dead. That means he has power over life. He has power over death. So why do we worry? Why do we let culture come down on us? Why do we let circumstances come down and, and steal our joy and control our actions? We can't let culture win that. When we serve the God that the power of his resurrection is over life and death itself, we've got nothing to worry about. Do we have trials and persecution and troubles we're going to go through? Absolutely. But knowing Christ, is worth more than everything. That's why you can say what you can say in the middle of a tragedy. If you're not a believer today, you need to understand the power of his resurrection. You under, have to understand that he went to the cross for you. You're the reason that he went to the cross. Because he loved you so much. Not because you were worthy or you earned it. He says, I love you so much, I'm going to go to the cross for you. He didn't just go to the cross. When they murdered him on the cross, they put him in the grave, right? You were the reason that he went to the, to the grave. He says, this, it's, a, it's a must. It's necessary for me to do this. Their only way for them to be able to have a way to spend eternity with God himself is for me to go to the cross and die for that person's sins. You're the reason he went. And he didn't stay there. He raised himself from the dead all for you and all for me. That should be encouraging for believers, but for non-believers, it ought to wake us up. It ought to say, you know what? He loved me that much. No human being can do that and have the same result. There, no human being is going to be able to do what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you. You're the reason that he showed the power of his resurrection on that third day when he walked out of the grave, just as scripture said it would happen. And just as he himself said in the New Testament that it would happen. You need to know him. Brother Phil, I'm going to ask you guys to come. We're going to enter into a time of invitation. More than anything, 
If you're not a believer today, you need to know him. You've been exposed to the truth. You know, the, the Bible says that everyone that does not know Christ is without excuse. Everyone. You say, well, the, the, this, these people have never had a preacher. These people over here, they've, they've never had a missionary come to their tribe. They're so far back in a jungle somewhere, out in a desert somewhere, where have you, or up in a sky rise in a big giant city, and they've never been exposed to the gospel. The Bible says you have creation. You can look around and you can look at the trees and the mountains and the sunset, right? A sunset can stop your day, can't it? You'd be busy, busy, busy. Run, 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 run. Wow. Look at that. It stops us. That's evidence this is a God, right? We need to know Him and not just knowledge. We need to make it personal. We need to make it ex where we experience Him. That's what makes all the difference. The power of his resurrection should change you forever. The day you, as a non-believer, give your life to Christ, that power of that resurrection, that's what brings you to saving knowledge. That's what brings you to Christ and, and drawing you to himself. If he had not raised from the grave, it would be a totally different story today. As a believer... Why worry? Why let the world and everything that it throws at us consume us? If God himself has the power over life and death, then what are we worried about? I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. As we enter into a time of invitation, listen, I don't know what your need is. Maybe you're looking for a church home. Maybe you need to follow the Lord in scriptural baptism. Maybe you just need to pray. You want to use these front chairs or these stairs right here as an altar? You feel free to step out at any time. And you come up and pray. You need someone to pray with you? I'll pray with you. You grab someone next to you. They'll pray with you. Maybe you need Jesus. Maybe you don't know him. Well, today, you've been exposed to truth. Don't leave and say no. Don't leave and say, not yet. Today, Scripture says, is the day of salvation. As we sing this song, you do today as God leads you. Phil, it's almost like you knew what I was preaching today. What a beautiful song. Could have taught the whole message with just singing that one song. It saved you 35 minutes, right? 
Listen, there are a few announcements I want to give you before we go. Um, one, we have a business meeting right following. We'll give you about five minutes and we'll go right into that business meeting. If you're visiting with us today, listen, we're excited about what God's doing in this church. You hang out for the business meeting and you watch and see how God's working in this church. We want you to be a part of that. One other thing is Christmas. I know Darren be happy. I mentioned the word Christmas. Christmas in July, we do this every year. We're a little bit beyond July already, but we do this in the Philippines for our missionaries there, Doug and Diane Lee. They are looking for 600 of each one of these school supply items. And there are several things on here. Uh, 24 pack of pencils, spiral notebooks, crayon, box of crayons, just all sorts of things on here. There are sheets just like this on the table right outside the, the room there. So you grab one of those. If you can help with that, we'd ask you to bring it to church with you and put it right here in this flower room. And we will just pack or uh, store it all there until we get it all together and then we will box it up and we will ship it to the Philippines they're even looking for baby items and flip flops anywhere from from babies to adults they pass these things out every year and it is always a great great time and we get to see some of the pictures of that so you be a part of that if you can and um, that would be good Anything else that I'm missing? All right. We're going to have our business meeting at 40 minutes after the hour. That gives you five minutes from the end of my prayer. Okay? And then we'll go right into that. It will not be a long business meeting. We've just got a few things for you. And then we will be, we will be gone. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's been good to be in your house. Lord, because of the power of your resurrection, we can... We can go through trials we can go through tragedy and still see what you've done for us still see that we are blessed Lord without you we would truly be nothing we need you each and every hour of every day Lord, be with us as we go our separate ways. Be with us as we go into our business meeting in just a moment and, and help us to focus on serving you, on loving you and loving other people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We'll see you in five minutes. Carry your hand up, run to the darkness. Thank you.